Well, hi everyone, and welcome to what is now the 11th annual Arrow Lecture. Uh, the lecture was actually initiated by Eitan Krzyzewski, who was sitting over there, who um, thought that Kenneth Arrow, who was the founding director of the summer school, uh, should be recognized by an annual lecture. And so he turned to uh, a generous philanthropist, Bill Ginsburg, who agreed to fund the lecture. The, the, the reason um, for recognizing Arrow, uh, every, everyone knows Kenneth Arrow's work, but uh, he not only founded the summer school uh, together with uh, Menachem Yare, but he directed it for its first 18 years. And I should mention that even after uh, he gave up being director, he was here every year sitting where you are now, uh, asking questions like, like you asked, but his were better. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, he continued until the summer uh, before he died. He, he died at the age of 95 in 2017. And he was, he was here through the 2016 summer school. So uh, a high standard to, to live up to. Uh, and we've had I think so far a pretty impressive record with the, the Arrow Lecture too. Let, let me just tell you who, uh, who the Arrow Lectures have been. Uh, the, uh, the first was Hiro Uzawa, uh, then Bank Tomstrom, Partha Dasgupta, Daniel Kahneman, Alvin Roth, Drew Fugenberg, Matt Jackson, Stephen Morris, Ariel Pecos, Jose Schenkman, and today, Mark Mellitz. Mark, uh, as all of you know, is uh, very well known for his, his work in international trade. He's the, the David A. Wells Professor of Political Economy at Harvard, uh, and uh, you all know much of his work, but the paper that keeps coming up in this summer school over and over again is his beautiful 2003 paper, which has been enormously influential. Uh, and now it's uh, a pleasure to give the mic to Mark. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I was hoping you wouldn't go through the list of uh, all the previous Arrow uh, <laughs> speakers, which I, I had seen, and and which is such uh, uh, such an amazing uh, uh, set of speakers, starting with the uh, original speaker too. So these are uh, uh, big shoes to uh, to fill. Um, don't worry about your questions relative to Ken's questions. <laughs> my answers won't be anywhere near as good, even on my own paper. From everything I've heard about Ken, he'd be able to give you way better answers. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to uh, we'll just have to live in this uh, imperfect world uh, without him. Um, so thank you very much again for for the invitation. It's a it's an honor. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is is based on a joint work with um, uh, Thierry Maillère and, uh, and Keith Hedl. Um, so today I wanna to talk about rules of origins. Um, so rules of origins are, uh, they, they relate to any free trade area and the restrictions on the contents, of the, the, the part content for any goods that one that is circulating within this, uh, within this uh, free trade area, so that it can only be considered uh, duty-free when the, when the final good is shipped between borders within a regional trade agreement, if it satisfies this rule of origin. And typically it's about uh, a percentage of cost or percentage of parts that come from within the region, although they can add a lot of other 
uh, things into it about basically how the uh, specifying things about all of the components and the parts that go into the final good. Uh, and so rules of origins are not as, as well known as the, its uh, other uh, cousins in, in, in trade policy tools, so like the tariffs, the non-tariff barriers, the anti-dumping duties. Um, but they are becoming increasingly important quantitatively uh, for one, because of just the explosion in the use of global value chains, which then kind of keeps hitting more and more of these, these rules of origins, because there's been an increasing number of free trade agreements that then each have their own sets of, uh, of rules of origin. And they seem to be um, manipulated more and more to be uh, to be more uh, to be more protectionist, especially in the case that I'll be talking about more, which relates to to NAFTA. It's definitely been uh, that way, as uh, as I'll as I'll show you. So, kind of one of what I wanted to do is first just show you how you can take a, a benchmark model of trade. So these models that you've been covering this week, you know, starting with the Eden Quarter. Uh, model for final goods, you know, taking the version that has been developed by Paul to say, well, we can also think about this as uh, a model that describes all of the, the, the global sourcing choices that a firm is making for parts. Um, and so we're going to kind of take uh, the uh, simple version of, of that model and just apply it to say, okay, how do we think about rules of origin, how do we model rules of origin within this model? So I'll, I'll do that and then kind of, and then show that once you do that, that you get this, this um, a feature that's not immediately obvious, right? That the rules of origin are meant to kind of increase the set of parts that are gonna be produced within the regional trade area. Uh, but that as you increase the rule of origin, you're gonna initially move in that direction uh, but that this, this is kind of part of the title that that can fire backfire, meaning that as if you increase it beyond the level, you can actually even decrease the set of parts that are being produced within the RTA. And so this is what we're going to call this Laffer curve for rule of origin, kind of same thing as for tax rates. So when you go beyond a certain uh, level of taxes, the tax revenue actually goes down, right? And here I'm not talking about uh, welfare effects, right? So kind of if you think about for tariffs, as you increase the tariffs, you're always going to limit the trade that is going to come in. It doesn't mean that that's optimal because of kind of the consumer part. This is going to be uh, uh, true here too. I'm just talking about the fact that you may not even be bringing more part production, uh, relocating more part production within your area by increasing the uh, the rule of origin beyond the level. So kind of go through the, the model for that um, and then kind of study this quantitatively. And this is going to be specifically for the car industry, which has, uh, and car industry for NAFTA, uh, where the rules of origin have just changed quite dramatically in the renegotiation of NAFTA that happened under Trump. Uh, it got rebranded as the USMCA agreement, but I, that's too many letters. NAFTA is easier to say, so I just call it old NAFTA and uh, a new NAFTA. And so I'll show you kind of using data for car parts across all of the range of models that are sold in um, the US and Canada. I'll show you kind of what the shape of this Laffer curve looks like for, uh, uh, for US cars. And then if I have time, I'll kind of go back to uh, the theory and then say, well, you know, another big effect uh, of rules of origin, actually, this is kind of one of the, the initial modeling of rules of origins was mostly concerned about this additional trade-off that uh, now you want to think about the assembly location as being endogenous. And then when you have rules of origin, it not just affects the rates uh, of regional parts that you use conditional on assembly location being fixed in one spot. It's also going to potentially change the location of assembly, All right? So this was uh, highlighted uh, earlier on, actually was in uh, Gene Grossman's uh, job market paper, which I didn't know about 
uh, until I started working on uh, on this project. And then, of course, there's this tension between if you want to think about purely in terms of employment, between employment in the uh, in the part sector and employment in the car assembly sector. Uh, and if we're, I'm going to show you a model, the, an extension of the model that's going to be feature that. But much more importantly, um, it's also going to greatly affect, even if you're thinking about just about the uh, shape of the lapper curve for parts, where are, is a part production going to relocate? And endogenous assembly also has some very important consequences for that once you add uh, transport cost in parts, because then when you move assembly, you're also changing where your cheapest uh, part suppliers are going to are going to be. So I'll show you that, and then kind of the last part that's uh, still work to be done is kind of doing the empirics also with the uh, endogenous assembly choice. So I have until six. Is that that's right. Um, so all free trade areas need rules of origin, uh, and initially it's it's just to prevent this. Uh, it's just uh, to address the fact that different countries within a regional trade agreement can have separate different tariffs. And so basically, what you want to avoid is just a situation of tariff hopping, right? So I'm going to talk about cars. The U.S. has a two and a half percent tariff on cars. The Canadian tariff is 6%. Mexico has a range of tariffs that are even higher than, than that. You just want to prevent cars that are meant for the Mexican market or the Canadian market to just go into the US and then just get shipped out to Mexico or Canada. Right? Uh, but rules of origins have evolved way beyond that in uh, just fixing this, this problem. In a way, I'll show you some quotes on the next slide that's very clear that it's not meant on fixing this issue, that it's really meant um, for, protectionist, uh, for protectionist purposes. Just so you can see kind of the increasing pattern, and this is just for, for autos and for NAFTA. It started out as a 50% one at the time when it was just an agreement between US and Canada. It went up to 62.5%. This is what I'm calling the old NAFTA, and the new NAFTA under Trump raised it to 75%, added some other requirements, such as the fact that the engine, the transmission, the steel had to come from uh, within the region, some additional requirements on wage rates that were paid at workers producing uh, and assembling uh, the, uh, the good. Actually, at the time, uh, the Trump negotiators, actually, they were wanting, they were pushing for 85%. The only concession that the Canadians and Mexicans were able to get is lower this down to 75%. And then rules of origin are also um, used in a lot of other uh, free trade area. You know, it's a very important issue for the car industry in the United Kingdom post-Brexit. Uh, the current deal sets a rule of origin at 65%. Now for the car industry, uh, assembly cost, I mean, labor assembly cost is around 6%. Total assembly cost with all the capital use is around 15%. Right? So if you were just trying to stop cars from uh, this, this kind of tariff hopping, you wouldn't need to have something much beyond that. It's very clear that it's meant to uh, achieve something else. The other way you can see it is it's the U.S., that's been pushing here in NAFTA for these much higher tariffs, uh, much higher rules of origin. If anything, if the issue was tariff hopping, the US would want no rules of origin, right? It would want all the tariff revenue and all the cars coming into the US that are then gonna go to, uh, uh, to Mexico and Canada. And then I, I have some quotes here uh, about the, the, new, uh, the new NAFTA rules of origin. It's very clear that uh, that the intent of this rule was to increase the uh, amount of parts that were going to be produced in North America. And clearly the U.S. negotiators uh, felt that that would result in increased part production uh, within, uh, within the U.S. So I mentioned kind of some theory, I mentioned kind of Gene's paper, there's been some extension uh, uh, of that work where I'm really going to focus more on the dimension of the parts that there's going to be lots of different parts. And so there's going to be this whole kind of sourcing strategy that a firm is going to have in terms of what set of parts it's going to source from within the region and, uh, and outside the region. 
Uh, and there's also been kind of uh, some uh, empirical work highlighting kind of that there is a lot of protectionist bite in, uh, in the rules of origin. Okay, so let me start with uh, uh, the theory. I do want you to interrupt me with uh, 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 questions. Yes. Yeah, so let me say, uh, why are these rules, um, so when you say it's the 62% or 85%, does that mean if my car is above that, I pay the tariff? Yes. So why don't we just have a rule that's proportioned? Like if my car is 40% abroad, I pay 40% of the tariff, 80 of it. That, that, that's, yeah, that, that would be one possibility. That That is not, so that is not allowed by the WTO rules, right? So the WTO rules, you know, you have these fixed tariffs. So it, and, and the punishment, again, for not, so what the US negotiators want, I mean, they really wanted to force, um, you know, for example, cars assembled in Mexico, basically, to have more US parts. What they would have loved to say, and actually Trump actually pushed in that direction, try to add some clauses on that, you know, to say, you know, well, I'd like to go to like 100% tariff, you know, make the tariff really point punitive to force them, but you're basically tied to WTO rules that basically says the worst that you can punish is this full uh, um, MFN tariff rate on it. So there are, in terms of policy design, you could think of it being done a lot of different ways. This is just kind of what's allowed. So you can negotiate a rule of origin. It doesn't have to be tied to only preventing this tariff hopping part of it, but the punishment is fixed. It has to be, it's the MFN tariff. Um, let me, let me also just kind of, uh, uh, so, so before going into the, the model, let me just kind of uh, mention an, an anecdote that'll kind of uh, highlight what, what, what the model is meant to, um, to capture. So in, in uh, 2019, BMW opened uh, an assembly plant in, in Mexico to produce the three series. So this is right before the new NAFTA was, was put in place. And I mean, it's a huge investment for BMW. It's over a billion dollars that they invested. And uh, at the time, there were lots of press releases talking about how they were going to work on increasing their uh, NAFTA supplier base. Uh, and kind of reading between the lines, it kind of sounded like they were saying, well, you know, we might not comply uh, now with the NAFTA rules of origin. The three series has a lot of demand outside of the US, so it's still. Uh, made it worthwhile for BMW, but they were clearly intending to move in that direction, right? So that's the effect of you have a rule of origin at 62.5%. It's going to give some incentive to BMW to really increase its, um, uh, its uh, NAFTA supplier base. Now you would increase it from 62.5% to 75%, right? So maybe BMW responds by saying, okay, we're going to source even more of our parts from uh, North America. Uh, BMW doesn't produce any engines or transmissions in North America. So that's like already a huge chunk that they would have to build in North America. Kind of maybe they do that, or maybe they say, well, you wait a minute, you know, we we're going to kind of move a lot of our supplier base that's currently in Europe to North America to satisfy the 62 and a half percent. Now that we're going to get hit with the MFN tariff when we set, sell to the US forget about it, we're just gonna use our preferred supplier base and we're not gonna increase our uh, parts. Uh, we're not gonna set up that supplier base in the US. So then you kind of see how it can have that negative effect. And you can also see how the negative effect is gonna be amplified if you now give BMW the choice to say, well, now that you know about the new NAFTA regime, right? would you build that uh, assembly plant again in Mexico or the next model that comes up? Would you build it in Mexico or would you stick with your European um, assembly plan or would you build it in Latin America? Would you build it in Asia? So clearly that's gonna have that dimension too with kind of assembly jobs, which there is gonna be for, for Mexico, but you can also see how that's also gonna have a really big impact on what uh, the origin of the parts that go into to the car are gonna be very different if it's assembled in Mexico than if it's assembled in Europe. I'll show you some numbers, staggeringly different uh, percentages based on where the car is assembled. And so that's the story, basically. This is kind of the story behind the model. So I was saying the model, so, so this is really kind of a, just a simpler version without the fixed cost of 
uh, a model that I think Paul covered today of, of in quorum within the firm. I'm going to keep it even simpler with just two countries. There's going to be home, which for now, actually, I think for the whole talk, I can talk about that if I have time at the end where we kind of look at heterogeneous countries within the RTA. But for now, just think of homogenous countries within the RTA that I'm calling home and, uh, uh, and, and foreign. Um, and the parts can come from home or they can come from foreign. They have these extreme uh, uh, value draws in terms of their cost. And the mean for the, the part at home is gonna be just normalized to one. And the mean for the part that you get from foreign is gonna be normalized to delta. But again, you know, these are stochastic. There's a unit continuum of parts that you need for, for the car. Um, when delta is below one, the firm has a foreign comparative advantage in, uh, in, in foreign parts. When it's greater than one, it has a comparative advantage in, uh, in home produced parts, okay? This is also giving it an absolute advantage. We could kind of wipe out the absolute advantage uh, away. What really matters here for the sourcing is gonna be the comparative advantage. Um, so with that, we can just apply basically the even quorum uh, uh, equilibrium concepts to say, well, you know, absent a rule of origin, I know exactly what the sourcing strategy of this firm is going to be. It's going to source you for unrestricted share of home parts that is going to be monotonically increasing in uh, delta. The more I have a comparative advantage in home produced parts, the higher the share of parts that I'm going to source from home. And it's also going to give me a very simple representation for the total cost of all of my of all of my parts. Um, so how do we model the, the rule of origin? So the rule of origin is just gonna say, so from the point of view of the model, I'm just gonna do it as a share of parts, then I kind of wanna move to the empirical one, I'm gonna go closer to reality by saying, well, it's really, it's a cost share. That's what they use empirically. But for now, think of it as a share of parts. So the rule of origin is gonna say, well, to comply, you have to have a share of parts that's greater than chi r, that's my rule of origin. Okay, and if you don't, the penalty is any good that you want to export within the RTA uh, is going to get hit with the NFM, MFM tariff. The way we're going to model it, and I'll come back to this later, it's not really important for the main part of the model, is think of this as on average, every car you produce is getting hit by this extra cost tau that's greater than one, which is basically averaging out based on the percentage of sales that you want to export relative to sell domestically. And I'll kind of show you that variation empirically. What is relevant here is you can also think of tau, just like delta as a firm specific variable. Um, so when the, uh, so how do you, how do we model then um, this compliance with the rule of origin? Well, we can think of it as just like a notional tariff. So a notional tariff on parts, right? Not on final goods. So if there were a tariff on parts, Right? The more I increase the tariff, the more and more parts I source from home and not from foreign, right? And those are gonna be the parts that are cheapest to source from home. And so if you tell me I have to hit chi r share of parts, it's going to be as if I had a tariff that raised my, uh, uh, my share up to uh, uh, chi r. Right, um, and so um, we're going to model the impact of a rule of origin as if there was this tariff, except that when I convert the share of parts to a cost, I just have to account for the fact that uh, the firm gets the tariff rebated back to it. Right, so as if there, it's as if there's a purchasing manager who thinks that there's a tariff row on all of the parts, and he or she is going to source a share of parts that is going to hit chi r, right? But then that manager doesn't know that in the end, that tariff is going to kind of get rebated back to uh, the firm. And so it ends up lower, it, it figures here, it's going to get uh, lowered uh, uh, a lower cost, okay? And then you can think about the cost penalty of complying, right? If your unrestricted share that you were going to, um, if the share of parts that you were going to use was going to be above what you were required to use anyway, then you're unrestricted. So we're going to call these firms 
uh, compliant, unconstrained. They comply with the rule of origin, but in an unconstrained way. Um, if not, if you're going to comply, then complying is, is going to raise your cost, right? And it's going to raise your cost by this ratio right here, which is what we call uh, C tilde. So I just kind of want to show you graphically what this cost is going to look like for different types of firms, right? So lower the delta, the more you have a comparative advantage in foreign parts. So the first thing about the rule of origin is it's a pure distortion. It's not uh, a trade cost, like an iceberg trade cost, which means that the slope here is uh, it's flat right here, right? The initial impact of, um, of that first cranking up from being unrestricted to cranking up the rule of origin is not going to have um, is not going to have a marginal impact, right? Because the firm is just indifferent between that sourcing that marginal part from home or for foreign, right? So you just kind of have to ask nicely to kind of get that purchasing manager to source it from home instead of from foreign, okay? So it starts out flat, but then what it has, but then it shows a lot of convexity, a lot of more convexity than if we were just showing you the cost of trade due to an iceberg trade cost, right? So kind of we know that, uh, I'm, I'm guessing this has gotten covered uh, this week, that for example, within a you know, quarter model, that it satisfies these properties uh, from this uh, uh, paper, uh, this ACR paper, right? That says that there's in, in logs, every percentage increase in the trade cost is going to raise your um, is going to raise the cost, the welfare cost associated with that by a constant percentage, which is that uh, theta parameter that governs uh, those kind of wide wall draws or which are, which are, which are just the universe. Um, relative to that curve, this one has a lot more convexity. So if I drew it in a log log space, it would still be convex, it wouldn't be flat. We reflecting how the distortions from the rules of origin have this kind of extra uh, convexity. Um, also notice, so I've drawn here just as an example, a 10% tariff. Notice that if a firm has a high enough delta, right, a high enough home comparative advantage, you could force the firm to go all the way to autarky for home produced parts. And the firm would still prefer to uh, comply with the rule of origin because that cost is below the cost of paying the tariff. Whereas for these other firms, if you go beyond a certain level with the rule of origin, the cost increase is going to be higher than paying the tariff. And then the firm is gonna say, forget it. I'm just gonna pay the tariff and not comply. Okay, and it's gonna happen at different rates for different firms. So let me just show you what it means for the firm's part sourcing. Um, so the flat part is just going to be the firm's unconstrained part share, that Caillou that I was showing you, right? And at a certain point right here, the um, the firm is going to become constrained. If it want to, if it wants to satisfy the rule of origin, it's going to have to uh, move away from its unconstrained share of parts, and that is going to mean moving along the forty-five degree line here, um, because I'm looking at part share here, and this is uh, uh, as a function of part share. So as soon as we go beyond one here. The firms are going to start complying, which you see them kind of on this 45 degree line. Every 1% increase in the rule of origin, I increase my part purchase by 1%. We see the resulting effect on the cost until I hit this point where I say, well, forget it. I'm not gonna comply anymore. And then I go back down to my unrestricted part share, right? And so you see that for the green firm and the yellow firm, it never happens for the blue firm, right? Because you can go all the way to one and the uh, blue firm still prefers um, to, to comply, okay? So right here, you kind of see this effect of the, the Laffer curve that I was talking about before, right? As you increase the uh, content requirement, right? Initially, you're going to get firms complying and they're gonna increase their part shares, right? And then at a certain point, this was kind of my BMW story, they're going to say, forget it, I'm not going to comply. And they're going to go back down to where they were before. Okay. And then I'll show you just some, some smoothing out that's just going to say, look, if I smooth 
on a distribution of deltas, I'm just going to get a smooth uh, Laffer curve. It's going to initially go up and then it's going to go back down. If I exclude the firm in blue and the ones that are always going to be um, uh, comply that, that are always going to comply, um, then I'm actually going to come back down right to the level that I started with. And so I'll show you that in a couple of slides. So, sorry, yeah. I'll, sh I'll show you it, it, it the the parameters uh, for for the for the draws. It does, but not. Uh, I mean, it, it it affects like the shape of this curve here, right? Like so, just like if I showed you this on a log log scale, the effect of an iceberg cost on on parts would just be a straight line with slope theta. Here, it's still going to have some curvature, but it's going to depend on theta. Yes. Right. Yeah. So this is a static model. So it doesn't kind of build that in that you also kind of have some costs associated with your supplier base. Um, so you can think of the data that I'll show you, you can kind of think of as some kind of steady state over kind of uh, uh, old and models and newer models. Um, and so clearly this issue is still going to be relevant for kind of new models, right? We're coming in, you know, I was just talking about with Jamarco about electric cars, right? Electric cars comes up. It's a completely different kind of supply base. Now you get to choose where, where you build it. Um, uh, but it's true that in, in, the, sh in the short term, um, in, in the short term, uh, your yeah. actual supply base is going to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> I just have to talk louder. <laughs> um, so there, I, I've already talked about these three types of firms. I'll just show this to you graphically. These kind of three types of firms. So now this is. I'm showing you everything here as a function of the rule of origin for different firms with different deltas. Now I'm going to show you the same graph for a given rule of origin, which here I've just picked at 70%. And I'm showing you here the distribution over delta, over the firm's delta. All right. And you just see that, and again, I'm, I'm mapping this kind of cost of compliance, this relative cost of compliance, this percentage increase. And we see here these three types of firms that I was talking about, right? The lowest ones are going to be non-compliant. They would rather pay the tariff than incur the cost. Those that are going to be compliant constrained, um, they would, uh, the, these firms would rather pay the, the cost than uh, pay the tariff, but they're constrained in that it still raises their cost. And then these firms, they can comply at no cost. Um, they're they're unconstrained, and the and this is the equivalent graph, which is just showing you what part share those firms use. The non-compliant and the compliant unconstrained, they can just go back to their unrestricted part share, and it's only these the set in the middle. Those are the the ones in that triangle in the earlier graph that I was showing you that raise their part shares to satisfy the rules of origin because they're compliant constrained. Um, Okay, so now I just want to show you what happens if we do put in a, a distribution of firms uh, over delta, kind of for the empirical work, I'll, I'll also do a distribution over taus because firms, uh, different car models are sold to different extent uh, uh, throughout even the cars that are sold and the, that are assembled in, the, in North America, 
go to different destinations with different market shares. Um, but for now, just um, giving you the distribution over Delta, uh, the log normal is a nice way kind of a thinking about it, because if I tell you kind of one distribution we picked that uh, uh, is, is, uh, is going to be one that's kind of going to be centered uh, around zero, but it, there's a very intuitive uh, way of thinking about both the mean and the standard deviation for a log normal distribution, right? Uh, mu of zero is going to be a symmetric distribution where you're just as likely to have a delta above one as a delta below one. Um, and then the standard deviation sigma is just going to tell me how likely I am to get um, a, a, a cost draw that's going to be a, a certain percentage away from, uh, from the mean. So here you just see the standard kind of percentages associated with uh, the, the standard normal distribution. Um, so when we assume this uh, log normal distribution, so here centered around zero, so it's symmetric, uh, with a twenty percent um, uh, with a twenty percent deviation. So just kind of going to this definition here. So we, this is basically giving saying that seventy percent of firms have less than a twenty percent uh, cost differential between home uh, and foreign. You see, kind of it just smooths out the the set of firms that that. Uh, are making these various decisions. Regardless of the distribution, we can always show that, uh, you know, firms are gonna start out as uh, compliant, unconstrained. You raise the rule of origin. Uh, at a certain point, they're going to become compliant constrained. So this has to increase. The green curve has to go down. The yellow one has to increase. Um, at a certain point, they're gonna become non-compliant. This curve, regardless of the distribution, has to increase. And then the only thing that's going to be dependent on the shape of the distribution is, is this share of compliant constrained firms always going to be uh, increasing and in what exactly is, uh, is its shape. And then you see that it doesn't go all the way back down to zero because it's stopping here at 70%. And these are those always compliers that I showed you before. So that was that firm in blue that I showed you before that you can go all the way to autarky and would still rather comply with the rule of origin uh, because the cost increase is going to be less than, um, than paying the tariff. And so this is the full kind of Laffer curve that you get with that, uh, with that distribution, right? So if we exclude the always complier, so this is the one in yellow, we have that property that I showed you before, we're just smoothing out over those kind of triangles going up and going back down. And so we have this smooth Laffer curve where you're starting at a certain part share and then you come right back down to the where you started. Um, it's just going to be shifted up when we add the that 17% 17, 17 of uh, of non-compliers. I've always sorry, of always compliers. Um, so then you can do, you know, is this shape of the Laffer curve really dependent on? So clearly the exact shape is going to depend on that log normal shape that I showed you. Um, just to kind of show you that we didn't pick specific parameters to kind of uh, just have a very particular shape. You can kind of change the mean, you can change the standard deviation of that distribution. John Marco was asking about the theta for the cost draws. So you can change all of these, um, uh, all of these things. You can change the tariff rates um, and you still get uh, uh, a Laffer curve that that has very similar shapes. Of course, you're kind of shifting it where the peak is and kind of does it go all the way back down to where it started or you know, how large the portion of always compliers. And then I'll show you kind of empirically what it looks like for uh, North American autos. Okay, the, the last point I want to make is this idea of the Laffer curve is really dependent on having these suppliers make decisions on multiple parts, right? So this is kind of the, the graph I was showing you before. And to kind of highlight that, I want to show you what would happen if we were talking about a single part. And I think actually in the back of the mind of a lot of these trade negotiators, when they think about just uh, wanting uh, uh, bargaining for as high a rule of origin as possible, I think what they have in the back of their mind is this version of a part sourcing where you only have a single part, 
Right? So what I'm showing you here is a sub, uh, uh, an assembler that has a part. And just, just for this graph, I picked that this part had a 50% share in total cost. It doesn't have to be 50%. It could be any percent. It could be, uh, I could randomize this across the firms. It doesn't really matter for the point that I want to make, which is that there's going to be no laugh curve. Like raising the rule of origin can only increase the share of uh, regionally sourced parts. So here you see the effect of a rule of origin, right? So the firm in blue, any firm that has a delta greater than one, um, it doesn't matter what the rule of origin is, it prefers using the domestic part, right? These two firms here have an advantage from using the foreign part, right? As soon as a requirement goes above 50%, right? If they were to use the foreign part, then they would get hit with 50% of here a 10% differential, here a 30% differential, which is what you see here, right? So what's gonna happen then is by cranking up the rule of origin, all you're gonna do is you can induce this firm in yellow to switch from the foreign part to the domestic one or the regional one. This firm, you're never gonna be able to force it to do it, but again, nothing is lost either. Right? So if you just crank up the rule of origin, what you're going to do, and again, there could be a whole bunch of firms with different percentages for what that part share is, but if they're making a decision on a single part, all you can do by cranking up the rule of origin is to get these firms to switch from the foreign to the domestic, uh, the regional part. And so a higher rule of origin can never be bad in this model. Right? So it's really critical that there is these kind of multiple parts in generating that lever curve that I, uh, that I showed you. Okay, so now to kind of let me show you some, um, uh, some empirical data and then I'll kind of come back to the, the endogenous assembly choice. Um, so first, just a way, just kind of, so, so the data that we have um, actually, I, I, it's, it's on, the, uh, it's, it, it's on the, the, the next slide. So the data we have is on part shares for all cars that are sold in the US and Canada. Um, the NAFTA rules on the regional content requirement also include assembly costs. So all we're doing here is we say, well, you know, we have to go from a cost share of parts to a cost share that includes assembly. And so we're going to use a measure of the cost shares for assembly, which is this alpha that you see here, uh, which for now we're just using as a fixed 15%. We're kind of looking at ways of endogenizing, uh, endogenizing that across different, uh, uh, different car manufacturers. Um, so that's one part of it. The second part of it is kind of what I mentioned before is that the theory is kind of simplest to think about the rule of origin as chi, meaning it's a share of parts that you have to use, but empirically it's a cost share, right? But in the model, we know what, how a cost share is related to a part share. They're monotonically linked to one another by this relationship. And so we also do this conversion between part share and cost share. And so what we can do is we can convert the chi that I was showing you before, the part share to a NAFTA regional content share by adjusting both for the cost share and for the share of assembly. Okay. Um, uh, and I think this is just saying uh, um, uh, uh, what we did before. Oh, no, and I'm going to show you cases where we simulate what the firm does. So kind of what, uh, when we simulate what decision a firm makes, so then if its total cost share is going to be, uh, uh, below the, uh, the NAFTA part share, then that firm is not going to comply. And if it's higher, the firm is going to, um, uh, the firm is going to comply. So Mark, I was thinking before, yeah. if the uh, change in the rule of work had a fraction of weight, mm -hmm. we're directly, you know, the new NAFTA subdivision, so that might affect the um, I thought that might matter, but actually, I don't think it would matter. I mean, even if wages uh, were to change that from those formula, for example. Well, it might affect that 15% number that we're using. 
Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, but, I mean, so 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 it it, it might. Uh, yeah, given a share of inputs, the, the cost shares would be independent of the. the well, the cost shares exclusive of assembly would be, but the cost share inclusive, which is written into the NAFTA rules, would would depend on what's happening to wages for assembly for NAFTA parts and for foreign and, and for foreign parts. Um, so one part of the uh, one part of the data that we have is just on what each uh, uh, car model that's sold in the US reports in terms it has certain requirements. So if you've ever bought a car in the US, you've seen that there's a sticker on the side of the window which is giving you uh, uh, this information. Uh, it's telling you what percentage uh, as, as a cost share are US and Canadian parts. And then it lists uh, uh, at least two other countries that have part shares that are above 15%. So the data is not ideal because if it's below 15%, they don't have to report it. And if that country is Mexico, then that counts towards their NAFTA shares in a way that we can't observe. Um, and it uh, and the other reason it's not ideal is they can report it in five percent increments. So it's it's not uh, uh, exact data. I'll show you kind of how we deal with that uh, empirically. It also tells us information that we also actually have from a separate data set, which is the where the car is assembled and the source for the engine and, and transmission that we have kind of comprehensively for all the cars that are uh, uh, that are produced around the world. What is the rationale for forcing this information to be on the lake? So I, I think what happened was it was a soft version of a rule of origin, right? To kind of, uh, you know, it's at the time to like the, the buy kind of, you know, buy American kind of things you saw like, the bumper stickers on cars that said, you know, Detroit built, you know, cars. So this was a way that, so consumers were supposed to be affected. Yeah, by, by saying, you, you just like you see labels on, on goods that you buy made in America, kind of with an American flag, it's, you know, it's kind of saying, it's telling you, you know, how much of it was made in America or not, but this was a this soft, more detailed much, much more detailed, yeah. yes. Who would care about? Well, I mean, e enough that they kind of, <laughs> so uh, that was, so when, even when I moved to the US in, in the, eight, I mean, there were still a lot of stories about like uh, foreign cars, you know, getting kind of keyed or otherwise getting vandalized because, you know, they weren't assembled. This was also before a lot of the foreign cars started being assembled in the US, so it became much less clear uh, to someone. Um, whether it was uh, American built or not. I suspect maybe this had, uh, was behind it, right? So that it, it gave, you know, the Toyotas and the Hondas who were the first to kind of start assembling in the US a little bit more cover. Yeah. Just a small clarification the group of origins are by, by model or by manufacturers? <laughs> then it's getting into the details. They allow averaging in different ways. So you can average for your assembly plant over the year. You can average for a given model, a Honda Civic, across multiple assembly plants. They, they very rarely use um, different assembly plants. I think Toyota Corolla, I can remember now if Corolla has more than one assembly plant in NAFTA. If it does, it would be the only one. But technically, that's, that's allowed. Um, and I think those are those are the two kind of averaging uh, uh, that 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 are allowed. Um, so this is the empirical part of uh, uh, cost shares once you adjust for that 15% assembly share, right? And it kind of lines up pretty well with kind of the peak just being a little bit to the right of that 60 uh, uh, that uh, that 60%. Okay. Um, and this is kind of data that we're going to use to kind of fit the, the, the model that, that I showed you. Um, so clearly we're going to have to make some adjustments, right? So now I'm just putting that log normal distribution that I used before. If I just 
put it just had this log normal distribution. I mean, granted, it's not even the right mean and uh, uh, and standard deviation. But even if I adjusted that, I would have kind of a bigger issue, which is the predictions of the model would kind of look like this, right? That there would be the set of non-compliers, right? And then there would just be this hole. There's no incentive for a car manufacturer to be below um, uh, 60% or 50%, right? It's like either those are the ones that are going to comply. And if you don't comply, you're kind of pushed away. How far pushed away you are depends on that tariff penalty that you're going to pay. And then you're going to get like this huge, right? The ones that are always going to comply, they're going to comply right by setting a part share at 62.5%. Okay, so kind of how do we get our model to fit this um, to fit this better? Well, one big part, like this whole part, right? Some of this is just based on how far you move out here depends on the tariff penalty that you pay. Okay, and that we have data on uh, model by model. And so what we can do is we can fill out this space by saying, well, you know, for some cars, they're going to be hit by a higher tariff which can be based either on which country you assemble in, but mostly even conditional on where you assemble, it's also going to be very much based on how many, how many cars you want to export within NAFTA, right? So just to kind of to take an example, um, the BMW SUVs, the X series, they're produced in the US. Overwhelmingly, they are sold within the US it doesn't matter that they would get hit with high tariff rates when they're going to Canada or Mexico. So few of them are, are being sold there, right? And so that's going to affect the tau, and that's going to kind of fill in this space here. Still, if you take the model seriously, you would still kind of have this discrete part at 62.5%, right? Why would you ever want to be at 62.4% and not, you know, qualif and not qualify? And so the other part of it that um, we're going to model is, is this fact that in behind this curve here, we don't observe exactly the part share that goes to Mexico. So we don't observe exactly whether you comply or whether you don't comply. And also because you're reporting those part shares in 5% um, in increment. One thing that we haven't tried yet is there's also potentially the issue of uh, discrete parts, right? This is a model with a continuum of parts. If you just had a few couple major parts, maybe the decision to comply would push you instead of right at 62 and a half when you can do it part by part by little part by little part, but you say, okay, fine, I have to build my engine in, the, in NAFTA and that throws you uh, to the right here of this curve. And this is something we haven't investigated yet. Yes, is it, is it and that was actually a question I had because when you think of the car, I, I suspect that there are a small number of very important components like the transmission or engine or yes. whatever, and then a continuum of yes, a very line. yes. So the first question I had was about the last car uh, when you go from uh, in between those two extremes that you show, which is the continuum in this one, if you have a small number of big ones and then the continuum and uh, I suspect that that would still uh, be a bit the same. And then the second question is that if you change the rule of the engine by a little bit, then probably terms might be able to adjust to the continuum. Like it's relatively easy to increase the uh, domestic content by a little bit by moving the small ones. But then if there is a big change, you might want to relocate, uh, I don't know, the transmission or the engine. So yes. Um, so, so I, I can com completely agree with that. In terms of the theory, putting in discrete parts doesn't change the, the Laffer curve, it changes the shape of it, but two parts is enough to kind of get to that Laffer curve part. Now, of course, empirically, that, that can matter a lot. So that's something that, that, that we haven't uh, modeled yet. Um, the, uh, the discrete parts, is actually an, an incredibly hard problem because uh, of the reoptimization, as you were just saying, it's not just that you want to put like your most expensive parts in first, right? It's 
if some of you know from operations research, there's like this knapsack problem, right? Which is saying you have boxes of different size, your knapsack can only hold so much volume and you have to find exactly what combination of uh, those boxes to put in your knapsack. We know that that's a very difficult problem to solve. This problem is even harder because in the knapsack problem, the box size is exogenous. You know what size they are when you put them in the knapsack. Um, in the case that we have, they're cost chairs and they depend upon which one you use. So it's like it's an endogenous size boxes that you're trying to pack into your knapsack. So we're trying to find ways of, uh, uh, of dealing with that. Certainly for the major parts, the engines and transmissions, we know where they come from. Um, and that's something we're kind of thinking about kind of how to, uh, how to handle. So the rules are not the Yes, they do. They do. So the, the required to trace, so they're required to trace that. So if the engine is built in the US with piston uh, in NAFTA with pistons made abroad, you're supposed to trace that in the total cost share that that content doesn't come from uh, 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 from there. Yeah. Um, so this I kind of uh, uh, explained. So like the other header, the main heterogeneity we add is a heterogeneity in tau, right? And so let me kind of skip the theory. You know, you can add your favorite model of demand. Uh, the easiest one to work with is CS, right? So then we get this relationship between differences and exogenous levels of market demand uh, for model by model that's going to tell us, well, how big of a tariff are you going to get hit, right? We know what the tariffs are, two and a half for the US, 6% for Canada, what they are for, uh, uh, for Mexico. Um, and then we can recover the cost, the, these demand shares model by model. Um, and we can look at, and reconstruct the whole empirical distribution of these towels. Okay. Um, and this is what they, uh, uh, this is what they look like. Uh, not surprisingly for the US, they're very close to zero. Well, why it's kind of the, that BMW example that I was giving you, like the Tau for BMW X series is very low because most of them are being sold in the US and they're gonna get the 0% tariff anyway. Canada is very tightly kind of set around the two and a half percent. And most of those cars are going to the US, right? And there's much more heterogeneity in green with Mexico because Mexico is also shipping a lot more cars outside of NAFTA to Latin America and even some to Europe. And then this kind of little bump here is for trucks, the tariff is in two and a half percent, it's 25%. Um, I am virtually positive that any truck that is assembled in Mexico is going to be compliant and it's not it's going to avoid this kind of 25%. Uh, uh, it's going to avoid the 25% tariff. So what we can do now, I don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm just going to describe it in words just so that I can show you uh, 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 the, the Laffer curves. And we can take this distribution of tau's, right? And now we can fit all the parameters in the model. So what parameters for the log normal distribution do we need uh, given this empirical distribution of tau? We add uh, an error term on our, our observed share, you know, to account for that fact that we don't know exactly what percentage coming from Mexico and from the other ones. And so we calibrate all of those parameters to basically get, give us a curve that matches the data as uh, best we can. And so you kind of see the parameters that we get here. We, all, we calibrate all the parameters, including the theta for uh, the cost draws. And we end up with our model fitted curve in uh, blue, which now is looking much, much closer to what we had here relative to the one without the heterogeneity and without that uh, measurement error in that uh, uh, part share that we see we reported on, on the car window. And so from there, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, what does a Laffer curve look like when we have uh, uh, reconstructed this with our model, um, and this is what it looks like. And this is where the old NAFTA is at 62.5%. Um, and this is where the new NAFTA is at 75%. 
And if I can, can I take two extra minutes just to talk about uh, uh, endogenous assembly? So you might think from this, ah, it doesn't matter that much. You know, I'm pretty close to the peak. So moving here isn't that bad. You know, so the first point I would make is this is just the peak in terms of part production in the US, right? The welfare peak is way to the left, right? I'm the, there's nothing in here which is measuring the consumer loss from higher cost cars, right? So once you weigh that, you're going to move the optimal one way to the left. So being at the peak is not a good thing. The other thing is this is, remember, fixing assembly locations, right? So I don't have time to kind of talk about the kind of the model extension to now allowing assemblies uh, location to, to relocate. But let me just kind of, I'll, I'll just make the point, uh, I'll just make the point graphically, right? So now allow the, um, now allow the assemblers, uh, we give them two choices. Instead of just comply, not comply, but stick with my domestic location, there's another way of not complying with the rule of origin, which is I'm just going to assemble and form, right? And so we give the firms those three choices instead of two. Um, uh, producing in foreign, well, not complying in foreign and not complying domestically is going to be associated with different tariff penalties, uh, which uh, uh, we see here. And then the key ingredient that now matters, that didn't matter before, is a, a transport cost for moving parts. So before we could just roll that into the delta, you know, a cheaper or more expensive foreign part could be due to a trade cost or it could be due to productivity and it wouldn't matter what the source was. Here it's really going to matter what the source is and so uh, trade costs and parts are really going to matter. Just to kind of show you the data to show you look trade costs and part really matter, I'm showing you the shift in percentage of NAFTA uh, parts based on the assembly location, right? So kind of moving from the left to the right, you see tremendous drops in these shares, right? Which is basically saying, you know, when you move assembly from one region to outside the region, you're gonna really change the part mix that you're gonna use from NAFTA. Incidentally, you see also huge differences in uh, even the NAFTA shares based on uh, the type of producers, right? I was using BMW as an example. The German assemblers in the US still rely very heavily on uh, European uh, and, and to some extent Japanese, uh, Japanese parts. So that really matters. Um, so I'm not gonna go kind of through the model. There's a third uh, selection, which is when you kind of become non-compliant, you may choose to become non-compliant and foreign. So let me kind of just show you that and then the main punchline. So what's going to happen here, so I'm showing you two firms with uh, two, different, uh, two different deltas. Um, what's happening, the firm in yellow is going to behave just like the firm we saw before. Here's its cost of compliance. At a, a, per, a point here, it hits tau, and it's going to prefer, and then it's going to be non-compliant domestic. Um, this firm in blue, the, the, these horizontal lines are giving me the cost associated with non-compliance and foreign. And so the firm in blue, which has an even lower delta, is going to uh, comply, then it's going to be comply constrained. And even before it would make the choice to become non-compliant and stay and assemble domestically, its best choice here is going to become non-compliant and foreign. And so this firm here, when the rule of origin is raised above, you know, 55% or so, 52%, it's going to become non-compliant uh, in foreign. And this is going to have a huge impact. Of course, it has an impact on assembly em employment. So if you care about overall employment, right, you're going to face this trade-off. So this is kind of one of the main points of uh, Gene's QJE paper about there's employment in parts, there's employment in assembly. But just sticking with the assembly part, so this is what happens to the part shares. So this line is that same triangle that I showed you before, okay? Um, this one is for the one that, that assembles, that's going to move assembly to foreign. So it's uh, unconstrained here, and then it's constrained, and then it switches to assemble in foreign. But when it does that, 
the part share is going to drop not to what it was before to way lower because that's where the the trade cost in parts kicks in right so this is this percent differences I was showing you you're going to move assembly to foreign you're going to also lower the part shares that you use from not the part shares and so this has effect not only on um, uh, assembly it also has an effect on the part shares and so the last thing I'll show you is what the Laffer curves look like now when you would allow for endogenous assembly so in all of these cases um, for different levels of trade costs, 10%, 15%, 20%, um, the curve in blue represents what the Laffer curve would look like if I kept a forced assembly to be in home. And incidentally, this is the same Laffer curve that I showed you earlier with the same parameters. Okay? So no endogenous assembly for all of these curves, the Laffer curve is in blue. And then now I'm going to allow an endogenous assembly and this is what happens when the trade costs are 10%, 15%, and 20%, right? And so you see that the peak of the Laffer curve shifts to the left, right? And then you're getting these much more pronounced negative, uh, negative effects. You can even get to a point where the effect is, the dominant effect is just the firm's moving assembly to foreign, and you're actually always decreasing the uh, domestic part share. You never want to use a rule of origin to increase the uh, domestic part shares. And so you kind of see in this world, so this is the one we want to take to the data that we haven't done yet, but you can see how in this world saying, oh, it's not too bad. I'm right at the peak of the Laffer curve. Forget about the consumer surplus losses. This could be a terrible thing, right? Once you introduce uh, endogenous assembly. And, and, and I, I'll end. Um, I, I, I will end with that, with that point. So, uh, you know, so, so I, I was waving my hands figuratively and, and, and actively, right? So I can tell you one thing for sure once we, so we have to introduce a social welfare function, right? That weighs employment, you know, producer surplus, consumer surplus losses, right? One thing that I can guarantee you for any kind of welfare function, right? Is that you never, you always want to be to the left of this peak, right? There's no welfare function that's going to tell you that you ever want to be to the right of this peak. Um, how far to the left, right, is going to depend on the weights that you put on, on that welfare function. And so we've debated whether we actually want to model that, which is really going to be dependent on those weights. What we're leaning towards is just we're going to report. So uh, we're just going to report, uh, we think kind of combining part and uh, assembly kind of cost shares or employment shares is important. So we're going to aggregate those up to report those. I don't know if you want to go all the way to take a stand on what weight we should put on consumer surplus. Um, so our, what we're thinking of is just to report it separately. Here's the Laffer curve for part employment. Here's the Laffer curve for assembly and part combined. And here's what's happening to uh, car prices uh, const at constant markups, so car costs, essentially and let you kind of wait your in the way that you would see fit. Yeah. But, but the Trump administration presumably wasn't concerned about welfare anyway. They, they, they were interested in increasing employment. Which is why this part, which is why I still think it's relevant to right. put this one in. And they were clearly very con concerned about it. They were also concerned about a lot of Mexican assemblers just paying the penalty. So they tried to put in all these clauses that said that if you paid over a certain amount of tariff, um, they would then revisit the, uh, uh, the clause. So they clearly- so This was to get Mexico to pay for the wall? <laughs> who, who, you know, who know the, clearly what, what they wanted was more, uh, they, they, they kind of saw the massive spike in assembly 
growth in Mexico. They were upset by that. A lot of the cars are coming back in the US. And they said, the, you know, what way do we have of stopping that? You know, you could just end NAFTA, which you kind of tried. When they didn't get all the way to that point, they said, fine, we'll do NAFTA with an 85% rule. So at least like a lot of these parts will be built in, uh, in the US. It's again, it's not that clear that that is what would happen even if you only care about employment, right? And get going back to the BMW example, the next time BMW makes that decision, it's not clear whether they're gonna to want to assemble in uh, Mexico or elsewhere in Latin America or in Asia or in Eastern Europe, basically. So I'll give you until tomorrow if you want for any questions. <laughs> Uh, 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 on this, although I'll be covering a very different uh, uh, topic. But if you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer them or to kind of stick around for a little bit. All right.